Good morning. I'm back. Well, first of all, sorry I'm late, but... I'm happy to be back. I'm here to play. There are some things I want to say. I'm going to make it real brief. Y'all had two weeks to do y'all's talk and let me do mine. I'm going to take my talents to South Beach to be a terrible role model, but still, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach. Welcome. It's 12.30 afternoon. It's Friday. That means it's time for one thing on Sportsmanlike Conduct with Paul Gerke and Mike McManaman. You are listening to Flint Talk Radio. We are streaming live on the Internet. Yeah. I'm Paul Gerke. That's Mike McManaman. Mike, tell the listeners and the viewers how they can get a hold of us. Uh, well, you can call us, 810-208-1854. 208-1854. Go to our Facebook page or uh, chat live with us at FlintTalkRadio.com. That's always fun, yeah. a live internet chat. Yeah. It's like Mike when he goes home at night and gets on chat roulette. Oh. <laughs> 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 Whatever. Let's get to top story. Uh, top story today. This came down to the waiver wire at about 10.30 this morning. The Washington Nationals announced that Steven Strasburg has a... Desperate need for Tommy John surgery, yeah. I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, that's a season-ending injury. They thought he had a strained uh, elbow ligament, Mike. They reported today that after a second MRI, he had a significant tear of his ulnar collateral ligament. And for those of you not in the know, Tommy John surgery is at least a year off. He's going to miss 12 to 18 12 months. 18. And a guy that uh, was probably the most uh, sought-after rookie pitcher. He had a, a great start to his year this year was in the talk for all-star selection at the beginning of the season, mm -hmm. and now he is sidelined for at least the remainder of this year into next season. Just a brutal loss for the Washington Nationals. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, we have some comments about from Andrew Keller about uh, the Strasburg injury. He doesn't think he can come back from it uh, the same way, you know, he started. Uh, it's always sad when you see somebody in their first year, or, you know, one of those young prospects mm -hmm. uh, go down. And, uh, you know, that, that brings up the conversation they always have. Uh, how hard do you push these rookie pitchers? Somebody that's never uh, been through the stress of a, you know, major league season. Um, he may never come back. He may never, he's probably never going to be the same. I mean, a lot of guys do come back, and some of them come back. I mean, Andrew Keller compared him to what Tiger Woods. I mean, not, Kerry Wood. Kerry Wood, Wood. Yeah. yeah. The other Woods we need to talk about. Well, Kerry Wood had Tommy John surgery in the prime of his career, and he, yeah. he's found a way to keep himself in the league. I'll give him that. But, I mean, you no. talk about this guy was a shoe-in Hall of Famer, you'd think, after his first couple starts. Yeah. He uh, was on a pitch count, uh, or uh, an inning count, rather, from the Washington Nationals uh, of 150 innings. Um, he got to 123.1, 36 innings remaining left on his season uh, when he went down with injury. So, you know, he was close. It, the Nationals tried to protect him like the asset that he is. I'm not going to hate on the Nationals uh, for what, the way they handled Steven Strasburg yeah. because, to be honest, I think that this is just one of those freak things. Strasburg, uh, for those of you not in the know, uh, the number one starter for the Washington Nationals, 2.91 ERA, 5-3 this season with a whip just over one, which is absolutely solid. Mm -hmm. Playing for a terrible team to have a winning record. I mean, the Nationals yeah. really just built their franchise around Steven Strasburg. And they'd what sucks every, now... They'd sell out every game that he was... I mean, that was like the one thing that was keeping people... They'd have a sell out once every, once every five, yeah. five, game, five home games. Um, you know, another thing, too, this brings up Bryce Harper, the number one overall pick that was selected by the Nationals uh, that just signed with the Nationals mm -hmm. at, in the 12th hour, supposed to catch Steven Strasburg for his career. Yeah. Um, now they're going to rely on him without Steven Strasburg. It just... It sucks, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's always unfortunate, especially with an expansion franchise like Washington just looking to to create a fan base, and and they get stuck with an injury like this. If you'd like to call in and talk about the Strasburg injury or any of the other topics we're about to get to, the number is eight one zero two zero eight eighteen fifty four. You are listening to Flint Talk Radio. The other big story this week, Mike, Tiger Woods divorce. Mm -hmm. He and Elon Nordegren are officially splitsville, as you like to say. <laughs> what just, do you think about it? Uh, see, I think it's just um. He got he he started he I don't think it has anything to do with how he's playing right now I don't think the he's he knew the divorce was coming so I don't I don't think it's a, a significant thing that he's it's final now maybe it took some weight off his shoulders and it's probably good for the kids just to uh, and probably good for Elon and now she gets to talk about it and go on what she went up she gets to write books I she thought that was one of the things they talked about in the divorce is if that I'm they not can't mistaken, write books it's about only it. the paramours that he had that can't talk <laughs> the paramours it's a the good vocab the harlots for, the harlots uh they can't talk about it they were given shush money 
but I think she can talk about it. I don't know how much she knows. I, I mean, she knows about just as about as much as we do, so I don't think there's any... She went right to People Magazine right after the divorce was final, yeah. didn't she? And it can't be about money. She's getting what, like... Well, that's the debate. I They estimate Tiger's net worth at $1.2 billion. Mm-hmm. Billion. Uh, with a B. So you think split splitting it down the middle, Elon would get 600 mil. Uh, initial reports out of ABC News say somewhere between 100 and 500 million. Still not chump change. No. You can have a lot of fun with 100 to 500 million dollars. Yeah. Uh, but still, I mean, they said the kids are going to be, it's going to be split custody. And you know that's going to work out just great because there's a professional athlete that's touring the world, playing in golf yeah. tournaments, is really going to be able to handle split custody. I guess the question now is Tiger can kind of do what he wants. What do you do if you're Tiger? <laughs> I mean, you could go out and get as many women as you want. Again, and this time face no repercussions other than being slandered in the media. What do you think he's going to do? You think he's going to shut it down? I mean, this guy obviously has a problem. I, I think he well, he had to go to uh, sex addiction, so I'd, I'd hope he. What a joke! Up. Wait, let's stop for a second. <laughs> sex addiction. I. Yeah. This is a little off the topic of sports, but like, sex addiction. The South Park episode uh, commented on you know, that. Sex but addiction. He, even if he doesn't, even if it's just made up, which it's it's possible, because I mean he's has a lot of money and he's an athlete, so he probably you know sleeps around. But he needs to focus on golf right now. That's what's made him his money. That's what's going to keep his sponsors. And he's shooting six under at Barkley. He's, I think he, he started uh, his round today at twelve ten, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But uh, he's just got to keep this up. People he's tied for the lead. If he keeps playing well, people will be talking about you know Jack, him beating Jack Nicklaus, and not about. I mean, it's always going to come up. It's always going to be in the back of your mind. But there's been plenty of athletes that have had scandals, and then people forget about it. You know, whether it's like a Rod. Or I guess not Barry Bonds, <laughs> but but uh, uh, players that have had you know problems in the past. Once you start playing well, I mean, pl- the the fans will love you. The still. people really care about sports. The personalities yeah. are really secondary. Uh, we just had someone pop into the chat box on FlintTalkRadio.com. You can join in the chat anytime. Flat out says one hundred million is what Elon is getting. She hears or he hears. He's got sources. Flat out has sources. Still a hundred million dollars. I mean, plus all the book deals and the the fame that comes with being Elon Nordegren. First of all, yeah. I mean, she's going to have it nice and easy, and she never touched a golf club or won a tournament. She's got a bunch of houses too, and she's she's never going to have a problem with you know finding somebody or, or it's yeah. How do you quantify sex addiction, Mike? Who's sex addicted? Uh, is is Ben Raplesberger sex addicted? He's got other problems. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, let's move on. I know you had another top story for us. If you'd like to call in and talk about the Tiger Woods divorce, the Steven Strasburg injury, you got the number 810-208-1854. This is Flint Talk Radio. Um, the other top story would be Michigan, Ohio State. Um, they're going to move the... It's going to be one of the, f- the early games now and not going to be one of the last games of the season for both teams. And it's always been, in 2000, for example, ESPN named it as one of the biggest rivalries mm-hmm. in North American sports. Uh, I don't think it has that kind of significance anymore, but there's a big debate whether it should be the last game. You know, the, That's always the, you know, the final game. They do a bunch of specials on it, but now they're going to move it. They, they said that they want to play two games. They want to play the early game in a Big Ten championship, which is kind of... With Michigan, you know, down for as many years as they have. And they haven't won against Ohio State in years. Well, how many teams are in the Big Ten now? 12, 13, 14, 15? Is it like the Big 24? <laughs> I think 12. But it's going to make scheduling tough. Uh, you're going to have to have divisions once Nebraska joins next year. Oh, they, they are going to have. They're splitting in two so divisions. So if Michigan and Ohio State are kept in the same division, as you'd imagine in that scenario. I, I, the reports are that they're going to play. There's no reason separate. to split them up. It's, it's the biggest rivalry in college they sports. They are going to split them up. According to... They're going to have something like Ohio State, uh, Nebraska. I heard it yesterday, but they're going to be. Are you telling me that Michigan could stay out of a conference with Nebraska and Ohio State and still be in the Big Ten? So yeah. they'd only play once under that scenario then. I, Basically, the question that we're asking the, the viewers and listeners today is, do you think Michigan and Ohio State should play twice in the college football season, or should we keep it the way it is, the border battle, the end of the season, the winner take all? Uh Michigan and Ohio State have decided the Big Ten Conference Championship. Now, remember, there's no bowl game. They've decided the championships by themselves on 22 different occasions have affected the determination of the conference title an additional 25 times. So 47 times in the history of collegiate football, that border battle at the end of the season has decided in some way or another the winner of the Big Ten Conference. Well... It has been significant for the last few years, and Rich Rod really has a year to prove himself. If he doesn't do well this year, 
He's not going to Rich be. Rod's not the issue, Mike. Whether or not Michigan can beat Ohio State has nothing to do with Rich Rod. Rich Rod's a moron. And I'm a Michigan fan. Um, I think that that's taking it too far. I think the question is, do you want to see this twice? I say absolutely not. I say it's ridiculous. Even if you are to, to put them in the same conference and play them twice, that's absurd. I like it better at the end of the season um, with the significance and all. But Michigan's just not relevant right now. They, this is probably, I don't know the stats, but this is the least significant they've been in college football for any stretch of time throughout their history. They're still the number one all-time winning collegiate program, mm-hmm. though. So, I mean, not, not to say that they're not going to be relevant next year. I mean, you don't really know. Yeah. I mean, like Notre Dame, for example, they've, they haven't been, you know, they've been good the last few years, but, you know, back in, like, olden days, they were significant all the time. And that reputation, you know, kept them significant for a long time. But Michigan, Michigan has got – Rich Rod is going to be gone after this season if he does not produce. And if they bring in the new guy, that's going to be even more rebuilding for Michigan football. Um, the bar is always set at beating Ohio State. Yeah. Yeah, if, if Rich Rod can beat – uh, he'll get he'll he'll get some more leeway and he'll stay a few more years. He, if he let's say they win six games and they beat Ohio State, that's enough. Let's be honest here. I'll I'll be the first to say this if someone else hasn't said it already. And you can hate on me if you, if you want. Michigan is not beating Ohio State this season. No, no, not at all. But Ohio State might run the table. They've got a pretty soft schedule. Yeah, yeah. and Rich Rod. I mean, that's why I think Rich Rod's gone. I, I don't know who you bring in. Um, Harbaugh? They were talking about bringing in Harbaugh. Um, I don't know who else you bring in. but I'm sorry. I'm not interested. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, do you have any other top stories? Well, no, I, I'm not done with Michigan yet. Uh, no? You know, I need to see the game once. I don't want to see it twice because what are you going to do when they split it? Yeah. You're going to have one side bitching about how, well, we won by 10 and Ohio State won by 7, and you're not going to decide anything that way. I think the real problem here is that the Big Ten doesn't have a championship game. All the other major conferences have a championship game. Why can't Michigan, Michigan, or why can't Michigan and Ohio State play in a, in a BCS-sponsored Big Ten championship game? That's what I want to see. Yeah, but you're not going to see that for Michigan. If you, I mean, they, there's so many strong teams in the Big Ten. That are, I, Michigan's probably maybe fifth. I'm trying to think. No, that's irrelevant, too. I mean, just because Michigan's not competitive now doesn't mean that that wouldn't be a good thing for the conference. I mean, like you said, Notre Dame hasn't been relevant in years, but you still have Lou Holtz getting up on the docket with his screwed-up tie on ESPN (laughs) talking about how Notre Dame's going to win seven games then Brady Quinn is going to lead the Fighting Irish. Seriously. He's got a speech impediment. He's not flying boy. I think he had a stroke, but I'm not sure (laughs) sure where the speech impediment comes from. (laughs) We'll let that lie. But Notre Dame hasn't been relevant in a long, long, long time. Mm-hmm. Michigan has only been irrelevant for, what, three years? I think and they're still a huge Ohio draw. State. Notre Dame even, doesn't even belong to a conference, and they're still a mm-hmm. huge draw. So I think, I, I think the, the popularity is there. I think there are some yeah. sickos that would really like to see Michigan and Ohio State play twice in a yeah. season. Yeah, but I, think, I don't think either of us think it should be changed. I, I don't see why. I think that's a, a great – it's one of the best rivalries in sports. I don't think you change it. I think you keep – going with what you have, because it is a great rivalry, even if a team is down, even if Michigan's down, and it's the worst they've been in, in their history, but it's still a fun game to watch. If you'd like to get in on this conversation, the number is 810-208-1854, or join us on flinttalkradio.com. The uh, chat box is going crazy right now. Someone just brought up Sean Kemp. I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> Sean Kemp is like the ass end of the show. We don't get to Sean Kemp. Yeah. Especially when he's not making news. Well, they were talking about illegitimate ch- uh, children, and Sean Kemp had more than anybody in sports history. He had, like, 11 different illegitimate The chatters are noting that Tiger Woods doesn't have any illegitimate children that we know about. Well, he's done a good job in that side. <laughs> but he screwed up a bunch of other stuff. So, uh, Let's get some de- to do, uh, do some Detroit topics here, Mike. Uh, I think we're big Detroit sympathists here, and, and we're not going to hide that, as you can see from the bobbleheads in front of us. Um, I heard a lot this week, I don't know about you, but people are hating on Adama Kong Su, mm-hmm. saying that he is not worth the number two overall money, saying that he is not going to have an impact on that Lions defensive line, saying that Kyle Vandenbosch is really going to be the catalyst for whether or not that D-line is successful this season. Look at Adama Kong Su's stat line through two preseason games. Now, granted, the preseason doesn't mean anything. The preseason is the preseason. He has one tackle. He's been playing, well, I don't know, I think four possessions in the first preseason game, and he played essentially the first half of the second preseason game against, uh, against Denver. What do you think about that? Are you worried? Are you alarmed that Adama Kong-Su isn't showing up on the stat sheet? 
No, it's just the preseason. He's being double teamed. Um, I think a lot of people are. Ha- I mean, there's some people that are hating on him, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of people that are are happy. They're, if they watch, if they, it's not. It doesn't always show up in the stat line as Matthew Smith indicated on our Facebook page. Go to uh, Facebook and type in unsportsmanlike conduct. A little plug. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't always show up in the stat line. In this preseason, I think he's going to have a good year. He's going to be double teamed a lot. They have a good line. I think they're going to get a lot of production from it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. I don't think he's. I don't think you can just make a blanket statement that he's a bust yet. It would be nice if he were to show something in the stat line a little bit more. But he's a defensive tackle. I don't think he has any sacks, which is disappointing. You, you, you'd like to see in the preseason. Yeah, but if you're getting sacks. double teamed, if you're a rookie being yeah, double teamed, that's impressive. That's why Bannon Bosch and Cliff Averill and yeah. those guys are going to see the stat line because they're the ones getting in the backfield when Adam yeah. Kong Sue is fighting off two offensive linemen. Uh, Matthew says on our Facebook, Sue's impact on the D line thus far. Quote, that cat got double teamed on his first play ever in the league. He's already <laughs> making an impact. And the, the, like, like Matthew says, that impact is not going to show up on the stat sheet. Yeah. You don't see a, a stat for double teamed. Mm-hmm. He says the people reading the stat lines are nuts. Sue is paid to get in the backfield, not the stat books. He's paid to free up blitzers, which he's done in the preseason thus far, although not put up fantasy numbers. Sue, from what I saw versus Denver, is worth his weight in gold. I'm not sure about that. He's a big fella. Yeah, he's a big guy. That's a that's lot like, of gold. That's like uh, Elon Norgren money there. So. But I think more or less we both agree with Matt that I don't care about the stats. You know, if he has a five-sack season, I'm not going to be upset about that. No. Someone just piped in in the chat on FlintTalkRadio.com that it's like Mario Williams last season. Now, Mario Williams since then, I caution you, unnamed chatter, Mario Williams has since really started to put up stat lines in Houston. But... You know, Nadama Kong Su, you're not going to be able to say he's a bust after his first season anyway, but I will say that the Lions defensive line had better put up a good show this year. Yeah. Um, from what I've seen from Vandebosch in the preseason, he's just an effing animal. He is just a <laughs> nut job. Good. Uh, especially when he's getting uh, double teams from Su, you know. He, mm-hmm. he and Su, I mean, Su, this doesn't show up in the stat line either, but in that game against Denver, if you watched, Su was living in the backfield. He almost had two sacks in that game. Yeah. Uh, but couldn't get the job done. But I, I'm not going to worry about the Damakong Sioux yet. I think it's way too early for that. Way too early. But that's what, you know, on the talk radio and stuff like that, that's what they love to talk about. That's what that's all it is. Right, right. But he's going to be fine. He's going to help immensely. They're going to double team him. He's going to free up the defensive ends to get in there and get some sacks, get some pressure on the quarterback, which is something we haven't seen in years in Detroit. Something to get excited about for Detroit Lions football. You know, we can get excited about the defensive line. but. That's something small, mm-hmm. and I wish we could get excited about more. But we can get excited about Javid Best, about Nadamik and Sue. About Javid Best. He's played well. If, I, if we had had our fantasy draft two <laughs> weeks later than we did. Now, we drafted for our fantasy football league before the preseason started. Yeah. Blame the commish. If I'd seen two preseason games with Javid Best, I would have taken Javid Best in the draft. Yeah. He looks like an every-down running back. And he fell in our draft. He looks good. He, well, how could you trust the Lions running yeah. back, especially yeah. when he's going to be splitting some carries with Kevin Smith and Maurice Morris? If I had seen him play in the preseason, I would have drafted him. He Definitely. looks absolutely solid. It's just the preseason, but it's something to get excited about, which for a Detroit Lions fan is significant. We mentioned fantasy football. We're going to get to more on fantasy football in a little bit, including a caller who is taking a one-year hiatus from fantasy sports. That's very taxing. I want to know if you could do that. Call in the numbers 810-208-1854. We personally live, sweat, breathe fantasy sports. We have been in fantasy basketball leagues, multiple fantasy football leagues. How can you give it up for a year? I was in an XFL Fantasy football league. That's how serious I am. XFL. That's pretty serious. Do you remember any of your players? I had. He Did he me. hate me? I yeah. did. That's the only. That's I the only had, player anybody remembers from the I XFL. I had Tommy Maddox, Pittsburgh Steelers fame. He was on. I don't fame. Yeah. You mean the Pittsburgh Steelers third string? He he started at some point. Yeah, but when Roethlisberger was in jail for exposing himself, it was before and Charlie Batch was. I've had Maddox on my Madden team before. He was <laughs> all right. He was on that my XFL fantasy team. He was pretty sweet. Like I said, we'll get to fantasy sports in just a minute, including a, an interesting caller who's taking a year off. But uh, for now, I'd like you to get involved in the conversation on FlintTalkRadio.com. Another thing I want to bring up. This is, is that a, Danny Worth is out for the season for the Tigers? When did that come in? Uh, it was Thursday. <laughs> it was yesterday. It's out for the rest of the season with a, read the injury, a Mike. Bruised left heel. That sounds pretty serious. Sounds like a Madden <laughs> injury when they get a elbow, elbow bursitis. Yeah. <laughs> And they're out for like... Out for eight weeks, elbow bursitis. Out for, out for career. If anyone wants to call in and tell me what elbow, elbow bursitis is and how it sidelines a professional athlete, feel free. 
a bruised left heel. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Was he out on the town last night in his, his dress and stilettos and fall down a flight of stairs or something? Those baseball players are real athletes. S- screw Danny Worth. Like the, we could talk about the Tigers, too, if you'd like to call in. The Tigers... Uh, well, excuse, we'll talk about Johnny Damon. Excuse my French. We'll get to Johnny Damon in a minute. Excuse my French, but the Tigers are a cock tease. <laughs> Take 2006, for example, when the Tigers end up in the World Series and just bomb against a, a, a St. Louis Cardinals team that was totally overmatched by the Tigers at the time. Last season, the Tigers hold the division lead for the entire season, essentially, and then fall apart in the last two weeks. This season, the Tigers are nine games back now. They've won six of seven or something absurd yeah. like that. It's still hard for Despite me to watch. Despite the injuries? It's hard for me to watch. I'm not a big baseball fan. I said it last week. But when they're playing well, and they're playing well right now, but when you know it really doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. I well, now, not, now, now that Danny Worth is gone, yeah, well, know, Dan- there I mean, go the Tigers' hopes. I mean... What do we have to bank on in the future if Danny Worth isn't going to be with us? Mm-hmm. I just don't care. <laughs> Bruised left heel. Let's talk about Johnny Damon real quick. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but if you guys were following Detroit sports this week, Johnny Damon was claimed the Tigers placed him on waivers, as we mentioned on our show last week, that they were speculating that they were going to put him on waivers. Uh, Damon was claimed by the Red Sox, and then he had, I guess he set up a no-trade clause to his one-year $8 million contract with the Tigers set up a, a no-trade clause where there were eight teams that he didn't want to be traded to, and the Bo Sox were among those eight. Yeah. And so, as expected, Johnny Damon, the idiot of Red Sox World Series fame, uh, rejected the waiver claim. Johnny Damon stays a Tiger. The Tigers eat the rest of his $1.8 million salary left on, on this year. What do you think Johnny Damon brings to the Tigers? Not a whole lot except veteran leadership, but... He loves Detroit for some reason. Maybe it's Where does that knows. come from? This is a guy that spent his career away from Detroit, essentially. Boston, New York. Who did he play for before Boston? I don't know if he played for No, him. he did. I'll look it up. But he, uh, Regardless, not in Detroit. No. Detroit, I mean, not, Detroit's a good city. It's just not like you don't dream of like living in Detroit. You dream of maybe Boston, New York. He played in both cities. Right. It's nice that he... He said that he always wanted to come here. I don't really understand that. But it's good to have him on the sc- – 8 million's a little excessive. But Is that Dave Dombrowski being a moron? It's baseball. They pay him outrageous. They don't have a salary cap, so it really doesn't bother me all that much. If they want to pay, pay. But Johnny Dame is being paid $8 million this season. This is as a couple games ago when he was claimed on the waiver wire by the, the Red Sox. 111 games, 111 hits. I hit a game, 30 doubles, three triples, seven home runs, only 40 RBI. Now, granted, he's batting a lot out of the two-hole. They moved him up to three at one point. He was batting leadoff when Austin Jackson was out, yada, yada, yada. But 40 RBI for he's a veteran a mohawk, that's supposed though. to have a bat. Let's not yep. forget about that. Number one Mohawk in the league. Woo! Yeah. 72 strikeouts, only batting 270. I don't hate on 270 too much. He gives you a little power, or he's supposed to, seven home runs. That's not power. Um I ran the numbers, Mike. You know I'm not much of a mathematician, but my computer has a calculator function on it. And so I discovered that he's making $72,000 a game, which is no Brett Favre money, who's making a million dollars a game this season, as we mentioned last week. $72,000 per hit. $1.14 million per home run. And this is a guy that's supposed to have power in the middle of your lineup. He's Two hundred old. grand per RBI. He's old. Way past the Overpaid. Prime. I think... Dave Dombrowski is really just raking in the jersey sales for a season yeah, of Johnny that's Damon. that's the only thing I can think of. When, but, they bring, when you bring in a player like that, like a Tracy McGrady or a Johnny <laughs> Damon, the only, I mean, veteran leadership, but veteran leadership, I think, is always a way to say, we want to sell jerseys. We want to get people in the seats, which I have no problem with. It's a business. But I, I just don't see him making a huge impact on the Tigers. A chatter in the chat box says, Johnny Damon played in Kansas City and Oakland before coming to Boston. Flat, Oakland was the team I was trying to flat think Flat out's of. giving us a lot of good uh, knowledge. Flat out. Yeah. You feel in the call in flat out. Anyway, what does Dave Dombrowski do next season? Johnny Damon, in all these interviews after he was claimed on the waiver wire, says, I want to stay in Detroit. I want to come back to Detroit. Don't give I want to help million. out Detroit. Don't give him $8 million. What about $4 million? What if Johnny Damon, $4 million next season? I don't Take hate it or leave it. it. I, don't, I don't hate it. If, it was like, if it's basketball or something like that, I have a problem with it because you're taking there's a salary cap. But in baseball, you can spend as much money as you want, and as long as Illich wants to spend, spend. I don't eight million. That's too much. But Five million. million. 
Six. Seriously, I mean, what are the, what are the numbers? Where do you keep him around? Because you've got Don Kelly, future freaking all star out there in the outfield. I wouldn't mind four million, but it's just one of those moves that doesn't really have any huge significance and isn't going to get them to be a playoff team. Playoffs? Yeah. Johnny Damon isn't the one that's going to. They need pitching. They need. They, there's all kinds of needs that aren't Johnny Damon. How long do you think Jim Leland's rope is in Detroit right now? I mean, assuming he doesn't die. Yeah, he can't smoke anymore. Well, I'm sure he's finding a way to smoke down there in the catacombs of Comerica yeah. Park. But how long do you think Jim Leland stays as the Tigers manager? They said they're going to keep him around for. They said he's Till a death to his part. Yeah, he's probably going to die in the I don't think so. dugout. I, don't I have a bad feeling. I like Jim Leland. I do, too. I feel like I can relate to Jim Leland more than past Tigers managers, but I think Jim Leland is, is on the outs, if not this season. If the Tigers just collapse, which I guess they're already post-collapse. Yeah. I mean, they're nine games back with not that much time. And we've seen crazier things. I mean, last year Minnesota was, what, seven games back before they mounted that comeback? We've seen crazier things, but I don't think Detroit's going to make a comeback. And if they falter yeah. at the end of the season because of Danny Worth and his bruised left heel or uh, a plethora of other injuries. I, you know what? I hope Brandon Inch gets claimed on the waivers. Is, that, is it like a week they put him on the waivers for? Because nobody's claimed him yet, and I don't blame any of the other teams yeah. for not taking Brandon Inch off our hands. Thanks a lot. Huh. Well, we've had a lot of injuries this season. That, that, Danny that's, Worth. A, that's an excuse. Danny Worth. That's an excuse. You didn't have a solid team to begin with. You know what screwed this team? Trading Curtis Granderson. That's what screwed this team. You Edwin know what? Jackson, too. He had an excellent year. He had a no-hitter. You know what else screwed this team? Max Scherzer losing his mind for half the season before coming on like he is now and starting the way he, he had a great start, no middle, and a great ending to the season. And you know what else screwed the Tigers? Joel Zumaya and his perennial injuries. Yeah. You know what? That doesn't even count in the injuries, in the injury talk for the Detroit Tigers. Joel Zumaya is, is a separate entity. He gets hired, injured every season. Well, yeah, there's Guitar Hero. There are boxes that can hurt him. There's <laughs> a plethora of things. He did actually get injured pitching this season, which is a nice change of pace. Yeah, it's different. That might be the first time. Another thing that screwed the Tigers, Brennan Bosch. Everyone in Detroit got such a, a big hard-on for Brennan Bosch halfway through the season, and then after the All-Star break, he just fell asleep at the wheel. He's been playing a little bit better recently. But, I think he's yeah. finally found that middle ground where Brennan Bosch's talent actually is. He's I not up have. here. He's not all-star caliber, and he's not a 100 hitter either. Mm-hmm. I think he's like a 250 guy with some power. I'm he's like Johnny with... Damon, except he can't steal bases. Yeah, well, I'm happy with him. He, you know, we can just oh, ring a ding ding, ring a ding ding. Someone's called into the show. We'll get to that in just a minute. If you'd like to call in, the number is eight one zero two zero eight eighteen fifty four. That was kind of cool hearing it yeah. ring in our ears there. So that's a first. Uh, John Wilson working the phones back there. Who we got, John? Andrew Keller, I mentioned. One second. Don't know his name. Hold on. Hold on. All right, we don't know his name. We'll get to him in just a minute. If you'd like to call in, like I said, the number eight one zero two zero eight eighteen fifty four. You can. Andrew Heller, I think. What's that? Heller. Keller. Keller. Keller's great. Patch him through. Right. Our secretary working the phones back there. All right, Andrew, how's it going? Good, man. How are you doing? Wonderful. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Gaylord, Michigan, because I am tuning into this great new show. That <laughs> Where's Gaylord, Michigan, Keller? Gaylord, Michigan is in the northern part. Uh, I work for a local TV station up here. I cover hunting and <laughs> tourism. Is that the only thing that makes news up there? You guys haven't had a serial killer yet, have you? No, just hunting and tourism. <laughs> all right, first of all, here's what we're going to talk about. Sue's going to be fine. Johnny Damon is a winner. Brennan Bosch. Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean a no, winner? No, no, no. You got to listen to me out. Brennan Bosch, they found his weakness. He needs to tweak that out. What, wait, wait, his Brennan weakness? Going to be not being able to hit the ball? Is that a weakness? The weakness is, is he swings at the first pitch every time. And then the second so pitch and the third pitch. Fan. Let the well, man talk. You. Let the man talk. Go on. <laughs> Brennan Bosch is going to be fine. He is uh, He's one of those guys that you want on your team because he has power. And he's just young. I mean, he's in the big show. They're expecting a lot of things. He came out hitting the ball. He came out smacking the ball, smacking home runs. And now they, they you know, they've, they found that he's going to swing at high pitches. And he's, he's going to he, – he'll be fine. He's going to be one of those guys that is going to put up that, you know, he's going to be a 300 hitter. He's going to have 28 home runs a season. He's going to be – you know, knocking in 100 RBIs. He's going to be the guy that you want before or after Magdal, uh, or Magdal, 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 Miguel Cabrera. I don't know if he's alive anymore. Let me yeah, ask you a Miguel. question real quick, Andrew. What is fine right. for Brennan Bosch? What is what? 
what is fine for Brennan Bosch, quote unquote? You said Brennan Bosch is going to be fine. What's fine for him? Are you happy with 250 and 20 home runs? 250? No, I'm not. No. If you're, if you're a fan and you're happy with 250, 20 Well, I think that's what his no. stat line is going to look like career wise. I don't think Brennan Bosch is any better than that. He's shown nothing to prove to me that he's better than a 20 home run hitter, a guy with a little power and a, a, a medium average. He's, he's young, man. I'll go 275. This isn't a bidding war. The price is right, right? I, you know what, Brennan Bosch. I need to see him next season. But I don't. This is a guy that who heard about Brennan Bosch before he was called up to the Tigers to fill in for injuries. This is not a highly touted prospect. And like he was the twenty sixth best prospect in uh, Tigers organization. Boom. In the Tigers, Tigers organization, the twenty. How many players you put on the field, Andrew? Uh, yeah, so I he's like four he team nine, all Tigers. This guy, this guy stepped up to the plate, hitting the ball. That's in, great. In the beginning of his career. But like you said, he swings at high pitches. He swings at the first pitch. These are signs of of a guy that doesn't know what he's doing out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, if you. If you look at all young players, it, they, it takes a minute for them to, you know, realize what Major League Baseball is all about. They're not playing in, you know, sandlot. They're playing with guys that do this for a living, guys that have been in the league for, you know, several years, batting against CC Sabathia and Roy Holiday. Even yeah, I, I mean, I'm talking Phillies pitchers now, but that's just absurd to me. But yeah, no, he, he, <laughs> hey, is he used to be to, in the AL. He is going to, he is going to be. A fantastic player, mark my word. All right, I'll hold you to this, Keller. I have sheltered optimism about him. So I, I have I, sheltered optimism is fine with all of Detroit sports, but <laughs> the reason I called in is because did you guys hear about that guy that walked from Munising? Munising is actually in the UP. They say a lot of A's at the end of their sentences, and instead of rag, they say rag. It's essentially but Canada. Did you hear about this guy that walked 425 miles from Munising to Detroit? I heard to, a little, uh, you know, to spread that word to the Lions. I hope you heard about this. I heard a little bit about it. I yeah, tell it. us the story, Andrew. I, I'm assuming right, you me, covered it. Let me fill you in with this story. All right. Last week, uh, was it last week? Yeah. Uh, actually, it was last Tuesday. Did a story about the guy. I work for 7 and 4 News up here for those of you that are listening in. Nice drop. Uh, 7 and 4 News covered this man. I was a reporter as well as a photographer. And, uh, <laughs> and this guy is walking from, what's that? Oh, go ahead. No, are you having another conversation, Andrew? Are we not important? No, you guys you guys are absolutely important. I mean, this is <laughs> talk radio. I love that you guys have this show. This is big. I have something to do on Fridays now. I, I should be working, but I've <laughs> made a point to uh, have this little block of time open so I could call in. I'm calling your news director. Any, anyway. Anyway, this is... No, you better not. <laughs> anyway, we... Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we I did this story about this guy that's walking. This guy is a 63-year-old man who decided to walk down. He's a diehard Detroit Lions fan where it just bleeds the colors of Honolulu blue and silver. I mean, you talk to this guy, and this guy is just an absolute, you know, just this is the guy, the type of guy that you want to be around. Anyway, I, I meet up with him, and uh, he is in a town called Rose City. For you that are not I've been familiar to Rose, City. Rose City, I don't even know if I could get there again. I had to have to type it in my GPS. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I found him, and uh, he was he's making the trip to spread the word Sisu. S-I-S-U. What is that? S-I-S-U. Sisu, Sisu is a Finnish term for guts, determination, <laughs> and glory. I, I, I can't remember. That it, is I, not I, even I close. Does this man have a mental illness where you're concerned for yeah, his he, safety? No, no, he doesn't. He's, he, he is like, I, 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 give me a second to think of a good analogy as I'm talking, but uh, he, okay, he is like <laughs> Dr. Brown on Back to the Future, just dedicated. Is that a good dedicated? analogy? <laughs> dedicated like Dr. Brown. I like it, Andrew. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I mean, that's, that's the best analogy I can think of the top of my, it, tip always, of my toes. It always anyway, he, he walks to the he walks to the Lions to tell him about Sisu. Sisu, that's amazing. <laughs> it always amazes he me. Made it, he made it there on Wednesday. And, and uh, WDIV, click on Detroit.com, has his raw video of this guy showing up. And he has this jersey, this, this, uh, this uh, jersey made with number 425, signifies the number of miles that he walked. A personalized jersey. His name is Joe Paquette from University of Michigan, making national news. I heard him on ESPN the other day. I mean, this guy is something that the Lions need to get over that hilarious hump that is more of a disaster than a hump. That's a good man. 63, I'm impressed. It always amazes me when you have a 
Detroit Lions fan that's so dedicated after so many years of being beaten down that somebody would do something like that. As someone in the chat pipes in, Andrew, this walking Lions guy is walking because he's diagnosed with high cholesterol. So brave, so noble. Hey, dude, I'd have high cholesterol, too, if I was 63 year old. <laughs> 64 years old. I'd be eating a lot of pizza, just not wanting to do anything after watching the Lions lose for 53 True. years. Andrew, you're, you make for some great radio. You're welcome to call into the program anytime. All right, man. Thanks a lot you take for care. Me. You guys are doing great. I like watching it. Thanks, man. Spread the word. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Okay, you can call in if you'd like to join the conversation, 810-208-1854. we got a couple more things we got to get to today. we got oh. like 25 minutes left in the show. i got some things I want to talk about. Fire away, big fella. They say it's the year of the pitcher. It's the year of the punter. There's two big da, 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 da. punting stories to talk about. First is the Plaxico Burris, Jeff Fiegel number debacle. Jeff Fiegel was promised a new kitchen if he were to give up his number 17 to Plaxico Burris. Repeat that one more time. Jeff Fiegel. Jeff Fiegels, who was a punter for the New York Giants. Was promised. Okay, you want me to. Do you, can we make this Mad Libs? I'm trying to noun. Make this, I'm was trying promised to make, noun. I'm, I'm trying to make this exciting because it's really not. No, I'm excited. He wants a, a new kitchen, and he gave up his number. And Plaxico's busy shooting himself, and he can't. Plaxico Burris, for those of you not in the know, is a wide receiver for the Giants who is currently in jail. I think he just got out. I think it says he's in jail still. Is it, he in jail Regardless, still? he was imprisoned and unable to deliver on his kitchen promise. I think Jeff Fiegel should be a little bit understanding. Jeff Fiegel feels like he has some kind of... He's important for some reason, but he's a punter. That's the least. He's not important. He's asking for a kitchen in return for his <laughs> uniform number. I don't think any other position in football would be that adamant and go to the national media about a, a, red, a kitchen being. How do you file a, a claim for that? I, they bartered it. Promised like, one kitchen. Yeah, I know. They bar, they, it's, there's bartering. I, they did the same thing with Eli. When Eli Manning got there, Jeff Fiegels had the number 10, and he gave it up for a trip. A family vacation, I believe. Yeah. Yep. Jeff Fiegels is not interested in cash, baby. He's just trying to get his family This is the most comeuppance. significant a pitcher, uh, a pitcher, a punter will ever be. This is the most significant. This is the biggest story of, of a punter ever, except for... Somebody, except for when they royally screw up. Yeah. There was somebody a few years ago, a punter, that had an axe in his thigh. He was cutting wood, and he... <laughs> that was pretty exciting. I remember that. Who was that? Was that was pretty exciting. The other punting story... Because this is the year of the punter. Punt away. Aaron Bates is the first punter to be named Spartans captain, which amazes me. I've never heard of a punter being a captain or a leader of any team. You don't typically work out with a team. You're a punter. You're the least significant member on the roster. I imagine I could punt. You could probably punt. It's not a, well, but that's, no. that's irrelevant. You're not a football player. Yeah, but pu- a punter is the captain? That seems ridiculous. There's got to be players with more clout in the... right. And locker room than Aaron Bates. I got the name of the axe punter. You're going to like this. Chris Hansen. Chris. <laughs> take a seat right over there. Take a seat right over there. Take a seat right over there. Chris, <laughs> Chris Hansen, a punter for the New England Patriots. He's currently a free agent, which means he's recovered from his axe injury, yeah. apparently. Let's see if we can find anything about the axe injury. Yeah, I don't know. Basically, he put an axe in his leg. That sucks. One other thing we wanted to get to today. Do you have any more punter stories? I, I don't. I, apparently, Aaron Bates is a really keep good re- punter. Keep refreshing. Yeah. I, he was up for the Ray Guy Award. It's a big preseason. <laughs> That's the pinnacle of collegiate punting achievements. He has been named a preseason candidate for the Ray Guy Award, which goes to the nation's most outstanding punter. How do they have a preseason poll? Like, who, who votes What kind of degenerate... <laughs> Morons are sitting around <laughs> tabulating the preseason punting polls. I don't know. I don't, how do you? Eh, I really think he's going to kick them all well this season. <laughs> Come on. Get a job, sir. Maybe he's a real good motivator and leader. Or a good coin flipper, says Aaron Franzen. There's two things we need to talk about left in the show. First of all, if you'd like to get in on this conversation, the chat box has gone a little crazy today. Zoltan Mesco. Zoltan. <laughs> 810-208-1854, flinttalkradio.com, you can chat away. We still have to make a phone call to an unnamed gentleman that we'll get to in a minute about fantasy football. He's taking a year sabbatical. You don't want to miss this. But first, I want to quiz my friend Mike on a poll that I found. All right. we got to talk a little hockey. I'm a proclaimed puckhead, a wing nut, if you will. I can't wait for hockey season to start. <clears throat> I did a little research. I do a lot of reading. 
This is I found on a blog called Nightmare on Helm Street. It's a Red Wings blog uh, devoted to Darren Helm. Yeah, it surmised this it's, uh, it's a great site. You should check it out. And they're not even sponsoring us. Um, <laughs> anyway, this is a Sports Illustrated poll. This isn't based on, on point totals. This is based on this writer's guts, his gut reaction, if you will, which is why I don't read Sports Illustrated, first of all. Top 10 teams in the NHL in 2010, next season. Top 10 teams. Fire away. You're going to be surprised by this list. I mean, not necessarily at the type of teams that are on here, but where they're ranked. It's kind of absurd. The Red Wings. Okay, the Wings, we're going to get to in a minute as to where they fall on this list. I will say they are in the top ten, but I'm not ready to reveal where they're at just yet. Uh, Guess the number one overall team. The Pittsburgh Penguins? The Pittsburgh Penguins are number three on this list. If you'd like to get on this conversation and guess at some teams, call the number, 810-208-1854. Now, Dan Durkin says Colorado Avalanche. <laughs> that reveals who uh, flat out is on the chat. <laughs> this guy's an Avalanche fan. The Avalanche are nowhere near the top ten, that Dan, a, as you should know. Dan, that was a horrible guess. I can't believe you said Craig Anderson's going to come in and be your Jesus and save you one more time this season. Washington Capitals. So. The Washington Capitals are number one on this list. The Caps are the number one team in 2010, according to Sports Illustrated. The Hartford Whalers. Yeah, the Hartford Whalers have not been in the league since '98. Oh. Wow, I've you don't really watch hockey track of time. Mike can't find verses on the uh, cable box. Yeah, I don't know. The number two team is the real shocker for me: the Chicago Blackhawks. Yeah, well, they won the cup last year. What? But they lost everybody. I know. It's now the Atlanta Blackhawks. <laughs> they, I, they, I think seriously, and I'm not. I'm not exaggerating. There's on a professional NHL roster, there's 23 players that you have under under your salary cap. I think the Hawks have eight remaining players from the Stanley Cup winning team last season. Ser- I seriously think it's that bad. They lost Andrew Ladd. They lost Dustin Bifuglian. They lost Dustin Bufflin to Atlanta. That was amazing that they got rid of so many. They nixed Antti Niemi. Mm-hmm. The only team I can think in pro sports that would do such a thing is probably the Florida Marlins. I'm yeah, not that's Florida exactly Marlins what it is. Marlins do the same thing. Whenever they have a good year, they just unload. Win a championship and disband. Yeah, I don't. You've got Taves. You've got Kane. You've got Hosa. You've got, I, don't, I think they lost Seabrook, too. They've got Duncan Keith. That's four players. What are you going to do with that? Somebody brought up Bernie Federko. Bernie Federko is my favorite. Bernie actual, Federko. Uh, That's all know, I have to say. St. Louis Blues, great. Where are the Blues? Are, are the Blues on that list? They're not, but the St. Louis Blues are going to have a good year this year. Yeah. They've made some moves in the offseason, not the least of which signing Yaroslav Halak away from the Montreal Canadiens. The St. Louis Blues are going to compete in the Central next season. Mark my words. The Detroit Red Wings are number nine on the top ten. Now, last season, they're marred by injuries. They still end up with an over 100-point season, make it to the second round of the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I think nine is just low. And that's, that's not me being a Wings sympathist either. I think that's yeah. just low on the list in general. Flyers at number four. They had Chris, a... Chris Pronger is a year older. I don't know. They made it to the cup finals yeah, last season. But year. that East was just a debacle. It was like the six and eight yeah. seeds in the Eastern Conference yeah. Final. Um, the Sharks at number five, they're a regular season Cinderella, but in the playoffs, they're, they're, they're the a Dallas, disaster. Dallas Mavericks. They so shouldn't have beaten Detroit last go. season. They skated by with a couple one-goal games, and they got destroyed in game four in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, the Canucks at number six, I think the Canucks are definitely going to be a top five team this season. The Canucks are solid. Uh, the Kings at number seven, resurgence with Anze Kopitar. I don't know if they're saying that they're supposed to sign Ilya Kovalchuk or what with his contract being up in the air. Uh, rejected by the NHLPA. Yeah. Uh, after the what is it like a thirty-year contract that was, yeah, was neglected like, from the, uh, yeah, the New like Jersey 20, Devils? I think twenty-six or something. If the I'm Kings do sign Isaac Kopitar, and I think they've got the cap room to do it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I could say that they'll they'll make the playoffs in the West. But if they don't, I don't really see the Kings being that high. Devils at eight, Wings at nine. As I said, Phoenix Coyotes at number ten. I like the Coyotes again this season. I like the way they came together last year. Is Wayne Gretzky still part of that organization? I don't think Wayne Gretzky has anything to do with the organization oh. anymore. I don't remember if he was a part owner or not. We could look that up. Yeah. One of our, our stat fiends in the, uh, in the chat maybe can get us that information. But I don't think Wayne Gretzky is any more associated with the Phoenix Coyotes. And that's ironic because they get the best player in the history of the game away from the organization, and suddenly they're a playoff team that took yeah. Detroit to seven games. Yeah. Okay, um, if you'd like to call in and talk about the Sports Illustrated poll or any of the other topics we've hit on, you know the number, 810-208-1854, or on flinttalkradio.com. We are streaming live until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's about 1.15 right now. We've got about 15 minutes left. John, if you want to see if you can get our caller on the line, now would be the time to do it. We'll talk just a little bit. Oh, we're beeping. We're going to call him live. Fantasy football talk. We're going to talk about fantasy football. It's that time of year. 
You must first dial a one or a zero. Reynold no. doesn't. <laughs> the anticipation's killing me. Yeah. Will he pick up? We'll leave him a voicemail. Let, leave the voicemail open. If he doesn't answer. He's probably working. <laughs> you shouldn't tell us you're going to answer. He lied. Oh. This is good radio. This is good radio when you try to close. <laughs> oh. Cue voicemail. It's busy. Maybe he's calling in right now. Yeah, it's possible. All right, that's enough. John, you can go ahead and kill that. We'll uh, we'll get back to Randy in a minute. Let's talk fantasy football. Hey, hey, hey. This Let's is Randall W. Scott the third. There it is. Follow me. Uh, you know, leave a message. <laughs> I'll talk to you. Beep. To leave a voice message, <laughs> press 1. Can we press 1? Is that even possible? To send a numeric no. page, All right, press we'll just 2 kill now. It. Thanks a lot, Randy. Um, you are listening to Unsportsmanlike Conduct with tone, Paul Gerke and Mike McBrannaman. We got to a tone. You Hold may on. Hang up or press pound for more options. Randy W. Scott the Third, you are live on Flint Talk Radio. Unsportsmanlike Conduct with Paul Gerke and Mike McBrannaman. You said you were going to pick up. We're talking about fantasy football. Your year sabbatical. Now we're just going to dog you on the air because yeah. you're taking a year off of fantasy sports, and I think it's because you can't take it. You're you can't scared. handle it. You're scared. That's enough. Anyway, fantasy football talk. There's nothing that engrosses me more as a sports fan than being able to get involved in the day-to-day -day with a fantasy team. Agreed. There's just an extra element that's added to me watching the Jets and the Bengals play on a Sunday in a game I don't normally care yeah. about. If I have fantasy implications, whether on my team or the person I'm playing against, it just adds excitement. You can get pumped up about a player like Thomas Jones. You can get pumped up against, you know, about Braylon Edwards. A yeah. guy, you know, I, seriously, there's cool. nothing that helps me be a better sports fan than fantasy sports. Well, we're kind of sports nerds. We play in an IDP league, uh, individual defensive players. It's kind of like the Dungeons and Dragons version of fantasy sports. You pick individual defensive players. Most teams, you know, they just pick the defensive teams. We, uh, you know, we had somebody pick Ndamukong and Sue. So they were probably disappointed. Pick. They were probably disappointed. He's only had one tackle. He's not going to have good stats. Was he the you. first overall defensive player taken in our draft? <sighs> but if, if we don't win our fantasy league, it's an it's only it's eight teams. So, so it's deep. It's, it's a deep league. It's very deep. Uh, we have another draft coming up on Friday. I think we this Friday. Yeah, right. that's going to be significant. It's always a great time. You always look forward to Sundays, Monday nights, Thursdays now. Right. That, that they wanted to do uh, Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, and sometimes Thursdays. And what's great about fantasy football, as compared to like baseball, I've never been able to get into fantasy baseball. It's 162 it's games. Too much. It's too much. You can set these once a week, and then you can just mull over the stats the rest of the time. I love it. I don't know how I'd take a year off and get back into it. To be honest, what Randy Randall W. Scott the Third is the person we're calling. He's a, a close personal friend of the show. Randy had a fantasy league that he's run every year. He has essentially disbanded it this season and kept himself out of other fantasy leagues. I think he's going to be fine until like week three when he's sitting on his couch <laughs> and he's watching, I don't know, the Bills and the Raiders, and he's going to be like, son of a gun. I really wish I had a reason to watch this game. Because now, now you're just bored, right? Because yeah. you're not hitting refresh on your Yahoo Sports League he or ESPN Sports Jamarcus League. He might Jamarcus Russell next season because <laughs> he doesn't know any better. There's always a chance he's going for Priest Holmes, baby. Yeah. Um. Fantasy football for me is just, that's kind of it. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I don't know. Always for football season. Fall. You always look forward to fall because of it. I'm going to read you, Mike, the top 10 ranked complete 2010 projections in fantasy football. I want to tell you. I want to hear what you think. Number one is Chris Johnson. That Solid. Makes sense. That makes sense. Even with the, the disputes he had in the offseason about salary arbitration. He's a Tennessee Titans running back. They always have a, you know, Fisher's always has a good running game. He's a solid pick. Adrian Peterson's number two. I have no problems with that. Yeah. You're not worried about like Garrett Blunt stealing carries from Chris Johnson? No, he'll get suspended sooner. sooner <laughs> Serial puncher. Number three, Maurice Jones-Drew. Again, I have no, no qualms about that. Yeah. Ray Rice is number four. Steven Jackson is number five. This is where I start to run into trouble. I don't want anything to do with a St. Louis Rams offense. In any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I've heard that Sam Bradford looked good in the preseason, too, and I haven't watched any St. Louis Rams preseason games. I'll be frank with the listeners. I don't want anything to do with that team. They're cancerous. Yeah. Who's, who's on the list? What do you mean? You say... Steven Jackson's number oh, five. Oh, okay. 
And this is a guy who said tons of injury issues too. I he didn't he didn't produce that well last year. Number and five I, overall. Yeah, I've had him a few years and I've always been disappointed. <laughs> He's he has to run for touchdowns and he doesn't always do that. He runs for yards, but. Frank Gore is number six. I don't trust Frank Gore as far as I can throw him. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I got burned once or twice by Frank Gore in fantasy pass. Once again, not enough touchdowns. Lots of yards. But well, he had 10 TDs in 2009, which is all right, and he had eight last season. Yeah, the eight will kill you, though. I mean, when you expect more out of him. When you draft him that high, you right. want more. Yeah, you don't really want him as your number one running back if that's the kind of production you're going to get. And it's not like he rushed for 1,500 yards either. It was barely over 1,100 yards last season. So let's stop right there. The top six fantasy-ranked players are running backs. Why do you think that is? I think it's an old-school way of thinking. Yeah. I think we've seen the last few years that quarterbacks, and especially wide receivers, have become more significant. When I first got into fantasy, it was all about the running backs. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me You take a running back in the first round, you take one in the second round, and you probably take a running back in the third round. The league is more pass happy. Mm -hmm. The NFL is more pass happy. Running isn't what it used to be. Running is not as significant. I'm not saying it's not significant, but passing in the wide receivers, that's where it's at in fantasy football right now. That's the advice for the listeners out there. If you're drafting a fantasy football team, trust us <laughs> because we're experts. I won one year. I did. I won last season. Um, I won the year before. The fa <laughs> fantasy football has gotten away from the running back, and here's why. Chris Johnson... Adrian Peterson, right here, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone else is just, it just plummets. The stock plummets. If you don't have a top tier running back, what's the difference between Frank Gore and, Probably I don't know, D'Angelo Williams or Ryan Grant? Is it really yeah. going to be that significant? Ryan Grant last season had a better year than Frank Gore, five touchdowns better than Frank Gore, and he's ranked number 14. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Why are you drafting running backs so high? I think you're exactly right. I think fantasy football has gotten more into quality of wide receivers your flex spot wide receiver or running back are you starting a wide receiver or running back on a week-to-week -week basis receiver. it's almost always a wide receiver it depends on the league too some for some reason some don't count catches as a point i think most leagues count I, catch I, or I catch for a point i've been in leagues without that too yeah. yeah so if that definitely wide receivers if that's the case but it just doesn't seem like a running back can just not show up one game and and you're going to get screwed by it right mm -hmm. but randy moss could have one catch for 79 yards and a touchdown and you're still going to get 10 points out of the deal, even if he was a no-show the rest of the game. You know, but running backs, you could get 20 carries and just totally you know, drop the ball, essentially, no pun intended. Andrew Keller, you can go ahead. Andrew, who just called the show a little bit ago, says, Example, a couple of years ago, Antonio Bryant scoring 53 points for me, final game to make me come back and win. I thought it was a done deal when I learned I was playing all day Adrian Peterson. Yeah. Adrian Peterson is one of those running backs where I'm fine with him being a top selection because running backs are a commodity in fantasy football. But what I'm saying is that after you get past the premium backs, it's not so much a commodity anymore. It's just picking for yeah. value. So why not pick a wide receiver? Why not take Drew Brees? Why not take Aaron Rodgers? Tom Brady blew up for you um, yeah. in points-wise mm -hmm. a few years ago. I don't and know you got him a value year. pick. I mean, I got Brett Favre last season in one of our leagues in like yeah. the 15th round. I hate Brett Favre. And Brett Favre had just a ridiculous season last I season. I would have liked him last season. Um but I'm not going to talk about my brags and beats in fantasy football. There's a time and a place. But, you know, wide receivers can just have more of an impact on the mm -hmm. game, I think. Definitely. Um, let's get back to the top ten there. Uh, after Frank Gore at six, Andre Johnson's number seven, the top one grad receiver. I have absolutely no problem with that. Andre Johnson has I been, has been a killer. Uh, Michael Turner at number eight, he had a, a real slow start to last season. He kind of came on in the last few weeks. Yeah. Uh, Drew Brees at number nine is the top-ranked quarterback, according to ESPN.com. I'm fine with that, too. I have Drew Brees in a fantasy league. I don't think he's going to have as crazy of a year this year as he did last year, but it's hard to go against a Super Bowl champion quarterback yeah. that throws the ball as many times as Drew Brees does. Yeah. Led the league in attempted uh, passes last season with 514. Um, Randy Moss is number 10. I think that's a little high for him. I'm not sure he's that high as a wide receiver. He kind of... Yeah. He kind of had a, uh, well, I guess not an off year last season by any stretch of the imagination with 1,200 yards and 13 touchdowns, but obviously not like the career season he had a couple of years ago with Tom Brady. Yeah. I think if Wes Welker's healthy, that's going to influence Moss's numbers too. Yeah. Um, for the better, actually, because I think Moss is going to be throwing a lot more deep balls if Wes Welker's an underneath threat. Yeah, and that's what he's always been too. It's I hope Wes Welker threat. ends up healthy too because it's going to screw me in a fantasy league if he isn't. I'm kind of disappointed I didn't draft any Detroit Lions players. You drafted a bunch. Well, on defense. It's, yeah. It's I would have drafted Job at best if we'd seen a preseason it's game. It's fun. It even makes the Lions more bearable to watch when you, <laughs> you know, root for one of the players individually. Have you ever drafted a Detroit Lion on your fantasy football team? You can call the number 810-208-1854. Pipe up in the chat. I don't know if I ever have. I don't. 
Can't think of one. I'm trying to think. I've never had Calvin Johnson. I believe I had Roy Williams one year. Did you ever have Joy Harrington? No. Oh, God. God, are you kidding me? I think I started him one game. I think I had to. If I was in like a 30-team league, I might draft, <laughs> draft Joey Harrington. <laughs> I might draft Joey Harrington now. He seems to find a way to end up as a starting quarterback on any yeah, given team. that's true. Um, Detroit Lions really do make it more interesting for fantasy football. I've got Lewis Delmas, I believe, just kind of a, a value pick. You have to yeah. start three de- cornerbacks or uh, defensive backs, rather. Yeah, see if he turns out. He could have he could have 100 tackles if the Lions secondary is terrible. I picked DeAndre Levy too. He's a guy I can just release in an 18 league. I mean, it's deep enough at linebacker that you can release a guy like DeAndre Levy. It's never a bad idea to draft a defensive player on a really bad team because mm-hmm. they're always going to be on the field. The Oakland Raiders. Yeah, I had Kirk your Morrison. boy, Kirk Morrison. It's not necessarily that. He, I mean, he's good, but it's that's not necessarily it. It's the fact that. He's going to have a lot of tackles because they're going to spend. When Jamarcus Russell's throwing the ball and what well, is Jamarcus Russell's drink. out, right? Right. Who's starting it? Oh, Jamarcus Russell. Yeah. He Who's starting drank in Oakland? Purple now. drank, and now he's out <laughs> for the purple the drank. The purple drank. He's uh, addicted to it, <laughs> so they kicked him off, and he's you know they wanted to convert him to like offensive tackle or defensive tackle because he's so big. <laughs> that would be hilarious. That would be. A top overall pick in the NFL draft at quarterback ends up playing D-tackle because he's a fat slice. One of my favorite parts of IDP League is when the person's not there to live draft and they draft Dan Klecko or somebody Dan Klecko-esque on their defense, who's now a running back. For those of you who don't know, Yahoo Sports, who we run our fantasy teams through, props out to Yahoo Sports. They auto-rank the offense so that the players are picked in a reasonable order, but they don't do that with the defense. So... Defense is like a random selection. And Dan Klecko, granted, is a versatile threat because I think he used to be a defensive player and now he's a running back he converted was a fullback. He tackle and now he's a, he was a fullback and now they consider him a running yeah, back. What an so. absolute joke. Larry Fitzgerald's number 12 on this list. D'Angelo Williams at number 11, I forgot to mention. D'Angelo Williams, I don't trust any Carolina running back really. I was forced to take Jonathan Stewart for value in one of my fantasy leagues. But you just don't know who's going to get the carries, who's yeah, going to get the ball. Always, yeah. And that's another problem with today's NFL, too, is these split-back systems, you know? That's a big part of it, too. That's another big part of it, is that there's so many split-back systems. So, 13 is Aaron Rodgers. Some people have Aaron Rodgers above Drew Brees uh, as a quarterback ranking. I, I think the Green Bay Packers are going to be a team to watch this year. Uh, just moving quickly, Ryan Grant, uh, running back at number 14. And Reggie Wayne, old standby at Wayne. number 15. You and Reggie Wayne are real tight. Yeah. So, what's on the show for next week, Mike? I have no idea. We'll have to see what happens in the world of sports. We might. We might. This have is the special, information I was asking for. I can't say anything official yet, but we might have a special guest, uh, Flint, legend in studio. So we'll have more. We don't want to say his name. Yeah, go to our Facebook page. We'll update you. There later. you go. There's yeah, a plug on Sportsmanlike Conduct with Paul Gerke, Mike McManaman. Friend, uh, like that, like the Flint Talk Radio page. Do that, do that all. The if, whole you can, the role. if you can tell your friends on Facebook to like the Unsportsmanlike Conduct Facebook page, that would help us out a great deal. And we will reveal who that special guest is, assuming, hopefully, fingers crossed, yeah. he is able to get on the show next week. Uh, Mike has been in, in Facebook contact with him. You're going to want to see this, and we're going to get Randy on we are. next <laughs> week. And we're we're going to get him to actually talk to us as opposed to his voicemail. You know, I, I had a feeling it was like a 50-50 shot that we were going to get his voicemail, despite what he tells us. Yeah, it always happens with Randy. So. Stay tuned next week. Big show next week. Big show. Hopefully. If not, you're just going to be stuck with us again. So Yeah, I'm sorry about that. And I know you're happy about that, too. <laughs> but uh, feel free to call anytime, 810-208-1854, flinttalkradio.com. I'm Paul Gerke. That's Mike McManaman. We about good for this week, John. Take care, ladies and gents. Thank you. We need a signature out. We do need a signature out. <laughs>